you have to hit that little accept. Um, I'm going to give it another minute or two because I'm sure some additional people will hop on. But before we do that, you know the deal. I like to kind of get a, a read of the room, a little pulse, and see what you guys are interested in learning today. Um, I'd love to know what you're hoping to have as a takeaway and um, a little overview. Have you had any listings yet? Or are you just looking to hone your skills? Kind of where are you in your listing experience? Okay, I'll chime in. Good to see you. <laughs> um, I've never listed, so all of this is going to be all information. I have, I've done on the buy side. I've never done the listing, so every inf piece of information is going to be beneficial to me. Absolutely. This is a great place to start for that because we definitely do it as kind of a checklist of sorts. Um, I know it can be really intimidating just as a peace of mind. Obviously, this will be a great resource for you, but just know you probably know way more than you give yourself credit for. Um, even if we've never done a listing, we've been through the buy side likely, and it's very similar, but regardless, a lot of details. So we'll cover all of that today. Anyone else want to chime in? Tori Ann, do you have any, I know you've been on a few of our calls, but I can't recall. Had you, do you have any listing experience yet? Yeah, so I was going to say I'm the same. Um, no listing experience, definitely been on the buy side. So just looking to see what that side is like and making sure I'm prepared for it coming. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, like I mentioned in the email that I sent out this morning, as you get into the business, and you start to streamline things, you can absolutely hire a transaction coordinator, for instance, to help with these things. But it's nice until then to kind of have your own process in place and to know that when that time does come, you have an understanding of what you want to do so that you can kind of use these as benchmarks to make sure everyone's on the same page. Awesome. Well, it sounds like we've got a lot of people that are new to the listing side. Does anyone else want to chime in real quick or should we go ahead and get started? Um, I just wanted to add, I've done a couple of listings and we have a, a, a listing coordinator, but uh, I thought this might be helpful in terms of just adding some polish on my end. And, exactly. uh, yeah, yeah I, I totally that. agree. And I mean, I said it in our last class, but, you know, on the buy side, it's like the fun doesn't really begin and the hard work doesn't really begin until you get that contract. But on the listing side, there's a lot of prep that goes into doing your presentation and winning that listing and getting it active. But after that, it's kind of smooth sailing. And so it's really up to us as agents to your point exactly, Terry, of fine tuning that process so that we really add value because, you know, it's easy for us who are in the business and kind of take things for granted to leave off some communication or exactly to your point, kind of polish those little details, which can really make a difference in getting that five-star review at the end. So awesome. I'm so glad you guys are all here today. I'm sure we'll have some additional people hopping on in, but until then, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome, welcome. I'm going to do a little intro. I know a few of you are choice agents, but there are a few guests. So for those of you that don't know me, my name is Kate Stedman. I'm the director of agent development here at Choice Residential. So we run trainings like these for all agents because we believe that knowledge deserves to be shared. Um, there's no secrets here in real estate. And so the more um, polished we can be as agents, the more well suited our clients will be as a community. And so um, we love doing these. We love sharing our knowledge. And so we kind of believe that a rising tide lifts all ships. And we're so excited to have you guys here today. So at any point, if you have any questions, please feel free to chime in. I also love some feedback. So if you have any personal experiences, whether from the buy side or the list side, um, I'd love to just have a little show of hand or raise your hand or chime on in or put it in the chat because no one likes to hear me talk for the entire time. So let's make it a little collaboration. So um, that said, you should be able to see my screen. If you cannot, just let me know. But welcome. Today, we're going to be talking about how to have a seamless seller experience. So in essence, we're going to be picking up where last class left off. Last class, we talked about making a um, strong listing presentation and how to organize all of that and how we go through it with clients. We're starting from there. So congratulations. You are in your dream scenario. You won the listing and you now have an executed listing agreement in your dot loop, or if you're in another firm, uh, whatever transaction coordination software you guys have. So now, like I mentioned, it really is time to get to work and start preparing our listing. And so in my mind, when we're getting ready to take on a listing, there's kind of two aspects that I want to keep in mind. There's the side of things where I'm getting the home truly ready for MLS and getting it marketed and published out to all platforms. 
And then I also need to be making sure that I, as an agent, feel really confident representing these clients and that I really understand the listing, that I'm going to be proactive in understanding any questions or concerns that potential agents might have, and that I'm really communicating in a way that's going to be getting the most bang for the buck for my clients um, and helping them have a seamless process throughout. So that said, I know I said it in our last class, but this is like the mountain that I stand on when it comes to my listing. First and foremost, we want to be getting our stager organized. And so um, real quick show of hands, who here is familiar with stagers and kind of their value or the reason we have them in listings? What? Well, stagers are very similar to designers in that they come in and they give a lay of the land in terms of making the most for um, a given room, but they, they're they a little bit different in terms of they have a true approach in terms of what is going to get the most for a given house. And so they're going to go in, they're going to go room by room with your client and tell them what to prepack. They're going to tell them what to get rid of completely. If there's any furniture changes they might want in terms of maximizing the space, they will do that. And if there's any updates or improvements that might need to be done, whether it's painting giving room, given rooms or replacing carpet or um, maybe even doing some additional updates, things like that, where there might be an odor in the home, a stager is going to be the one that's helping to guide your clients and telling them what to do. And they'll do that in a list type format, room by room. And the reason I like to do this, yes, absolutely. Like from past experience, having a good number of listings and sitting in on a number of these staging consultations, I could definitely do this myself. But I think that there is great value in having a third party do this because it really helps us preserve our relationship with the client. And so if you walk in, you go to take that list, and especially if they're friends or people you know, or even if they don't and you're still trying to build that relationship, it can be a little uncomfortable to be like, oh, it smells like dog in here, right? Or if you know that someone has smoked in the home for years and it's going to be a little bit costly to mitigate that. Or if you walk in and it's just like a bright orange paint color and you're like, this has got to go, right? But this is one of your first meetings with the client. You don't want to be starting out of the gate by telling them how their home doesn't measure up or things that are immediately going to cost them money. And so I say all that to say that I am a strong believer in ordering a stager. Any product that is advertised online is going to be, you know, incredibly clean. It's going to be polished. It's going to be photographed from the right angles with the right lighting, even if we're talking about shoes, right? So if we're talking about someone's largest financial asset, we absolutely want to make sure that it shines. And so um, all of that to say, is something I'm really passionate about. So whether this is something that you put on your clients to do and you simply connect them with the stager, or if it's something that you put, add as a part of your listing process, which is what I do, it's, you know, it's two to $300. It's not the cheapest, but it's not too bad. In my mind, this is a non-negotiable that I as a listing agent will always pay for because I want to make sure this is something that's done. And then, like I said, it's nice to have kind of third parties backing you up for things. And so I always use the script of um, they're going to tell you everything that works and they're always going to be telling you things that will guarantee you maximize your profits at the end. So, for instance, if your whole house needs painting, but that's not in the budget, they will only recommend that you do the living room and kitchen and the owner's bedroom if possible. They're never going to walk in and be like, oh, you need to paint that secondary bedroom. So just kind of keep all of that in mind. Also, this gives the seller something to focus on while they have time. So there are some people that are going to be needing to move ASAP, in which case we got to get on this right now. There's other people that we might meet with that say, well, you know, I don't really want to sell until the end of the year, but this will give them something to do in the meantime, because let's be real, no one wants to get to October and realize that they have all of this work to do when they could have used the past nine months to get it done. So um, just do this proactively. And so I always use the phrase, I'm going to go ahead and connect you with the stager while I'm getting your file organized and getting everything into MLS. You go ahead and get on, work on getting your home ready. So just as a few little tidbits. One, we do have a stager that we highly recommend. Her name is Ellie Mays. She does an amazing job um, working for our clients. And so really and truly, she'll come in 
typically into lived in homes and tell them what to prepack. And so a common example that you'll see is um, a living room rug, for instance, it can look amazing in person, but very often the stager will recommend that you remove that because removing it will maximize the space and help draw down your eye, especially if there's some really good flooring. They might again change the layout of the sofas and things like that. So this is the design company that we recommend. It's called Upstaging Designs. Um, also, for a point of reference, I'm going to use a quick example, hopping back over to my listing presentation that some of you may have seen the other day, but I've got a few before and after photos. And I know we're not HGTV, but this is one part of the business that I really do love is kind of the before and after. This was um, these were some past clients of mine. I'd help them purchase this property and then they were going to sell. And so they had two husky dogs, aka a lot of shedding. They also had a um, a baby under one. So they had a lot of stuff on the counters. They just had a lot that they were going to need to prepack. And so um, this these were the before photos. Mainly you'll see here exactly like I said, there's a lot of stuff on the ground. They've got a rug down and there's a lot of stuff on the counters. And so by the time it was all said and done, this is what it ended up looking like. And I think we can all agree, as much as we hate to say it, a buyer is going to pay more for a house like this than they would for a house like this. And so if we are making this advice, then we are setting our clients up for success to getting them top dollar for their home. All right. I think you understand that it's something I'm passionate about. Oh. Next, we are going to be organizing photos. This is my second thing that I stand on, having strong photographs. As you can tell, not only was that home staged, but it was professionally photographed. And so um, I will tell them, you know, based on the timeline of what their activation plan is, after they get it staged, we're then going to be doing photos. And so I I use our staging list as kind of our dream scenario. They're going to do, they're going to list anything and everything that you need to do. If you can do it all, that's great, but don't run yourself ragged. We'll rank it in priority. And the more you can get done, the better. Just do a few things here and there. But once, once it's time to go, you know, about three days before listing at the latest, we're going to be getting photographs ordered. Now, that said, again, if we're in that scenario where um, they want to list in October, I absolutely could have photos done in September or maybe even a touch sooner if they don't plan on changing too much in the home um, and if that would alleviate some pressure. So just kind of work with your clients on that. Now, that said, we do want to make sure that we have a plan for access for these vendors. Some photographers have MLS access, in which case they're going to have access to the home on their own. Regardless, I always recommend two visits to the home. One after your listing presentation. One is going to be a few days before photos. This is likely after they've done as much of the staging as possible. And this is to make sure that everything looks the way that it should in order for photos. If there are any items that need to be moved that in my mind are pretty big um, in terms of making a dramatic impact in the way that things are going to appear, then I might be adding those things. Or if it's a vacant home, I'm likely gonna be bringing in a few small staging items. No need to add things to your budget. However, I do, you know, occasionally buy some of the white pack of towels from Costco. Just have one pack of those on hand and a few, um, a few little cookbooks or things of that sort. And I'll put those in the bathrooms because I believe that that just makes a big difference. Um, so I'll do that a few days before photos. And then I will also go on the day of photos because I want to make sure that everything looks the way that it should. On the day of photos, I want to make sure that all of the bathrooms look as presentable as possible. That means everything is off the counters, including your hand soap. Just worst case, stick it under the cabinet. Um, toilet seats need to be down and shower curtains either need to be completely closed if there's stuff in the tub still, or they can be pushed back, but just make sure that anything in terms of shampoo, body wash, razors, loofahs, whatever, are also out of the shower. Additionally, I wanna make sure that the blinds are in the correct position. In my opinion, and very often what I will hear from the stagers is that when you are taking interior photos, you want the blinds open and raised to the sash. So like halfway and open. And then for exterior photos, you want them all the way down and open. And so as they're kind of going in and out, you're going to want to make those adjustments. I also will likely move trash cans out of the way, both on the inside when they're doing kitchen photos or on the outside, if they're kind of front and center, I wanna be just making sure that any distractions are out of the way. 
And then if there's any specific features that I want to make sure are photographed, I need to be communicating that. If it is in a community that has a lot of amenities, for example, I might want to add on that part of photography to my order. I might also add on some drone photography if it's in a very convenient location or if it's on a lot of acreage. I had a townhome listing right near North Hills a few years ago. And so I absolutely, when I ordered photos, had drone photography done to show how close the property was to North Hills because it was walkable. Make sure that those selling features are, are noted. Um, and make sure it's just kind of a nice peace of mind for the sellers to know that we will be there during photos. Then once we do both of those things, we're going to email the sellers a plan for everything. We're going to email them a plan for the vendor dates, the times, who's going to be there when, and any deadlines for things. Now, I think a lot of this also depends on how much work we feel our sellers need to do, but just making sure that we're communicating with them what the plan is. Then that's kind of the fluff of it. That's the exciting part. Then we're going to do everything on the back end. That's a little more boring, but really helps make sure that we're covering our bases in terms of material facts and truly representing this property to the fullest. So these are going to be things like pulling the deed. That is number one. If you attended my listing class last week, you will know that as soon as you finish your listing appointment or get off that phone call, I'm going to be pulling the deed to make sure that the person that I've had this conversation with and that is claiming to be the seller is actually the seller. I'm also going to do things like check the USDA map to see if it's eligible for a USDA loan. I'm going to check the flight path for RDU to make sure that it's not under a flight path. If it is, I need to disclose that. Same thing with the 540 map and the FEMA map. I'm going to see if it's near any train tracks or highways. Um, if it is near train tracks, try to work with your sellers to see if they know when the trains most commonly come by. I'm going to get information on the HOA fees. I'm going to reach out to the HOA company or management company if needed. I need to know what those fees are and how frequently they are billed. Additionally, I want to be asking if there is any transfer fee associated with a new owner taking over the property. Sometimes that's the case. It's normally like 250. And so if that is the case, you want to be proactive in saying, will the seller be paying that or will the buyer be paying it? We also want to get a copy of those restrictive covenants when we're talking to the HOA company. If it's on septic, septic permit, same thing with well, any permitting we want to have a copy of. Now, I know this is a lot. So I'm going to stop sharing for just a second and share a different screen with you. If that seems intimidating, fret not. We actually have an entire list on the choice intranet that tells you what we need to be researching and where you can find that information. So don't worry, I'll send this as an attachment when I email this out to you guys. For those of you that are new here after the classes, I always send an email with a copy of the recording that you can watch back if you'd like to, a copy of the slides and anything else that we've referenced. So just know we've got a lot to do, but we do have a checklist for it. I know I'm kind of running through things. How are we doing so far? It's a little fast, I know. You guys hanging in there? We're good. Okay, thank you. <laughs> all right, then I'm going to be working to get all of the documents that I need for my file. Typically, this means we're going to be getting back the disclosures. I know my kind of standard process is that although I can send it through Dotloop, for whatever reason, I really like my mineral, oil, and gas and residential property disclosures to be hand signed and filled out by the sellers. So typically when I'm there for my listing appointment, I will leave that those documents with them. Um, and so when I go back for that last staging appointment or I'm going the day before photos, whatever the case may be, I'm going to be getting those documents from them and scanning them into my file. Or like I said, I'm going to be sending them through dot loop. I'm going to get any remaining documents that I need including likely a list of any updates that they've done. Um, if they had any systems replaced, getting a copy of those warranties and understanding if those are transferable, if they've got a new roof or new HVAC. I'm also gonna get a copy of any surveys or plat maps that they have, if available. Any alarm information, this one is crucial and you don't realize how important it is until it's kind of too late and you don't realize they have an alarm and someone walks in and sets it off. So if there is an alarm, making sure that you and the seller are on the same plan in terms of will it be on or will it be off when showings are taking place. 
And if it, regardless, what is the code, just in case you forget and you do set it on your way out. If there is a propane tank at the property, we need to understand whether it is owned or whether it is leased, and we need that information. I'm going to gather all of this. I typically will just, as I get it, I'll be putting it into PDF form and uploading it into my dot loop. So as we're doing all of this, the sellers are going to be finishing their staging. Typically, I will have them send me photos along the way. Now, Ellie is also really good in terms of if there are any questions that your clients have as they are doing staging, they can also send a copy of a picture to her and just say, hey, by the way, I'm in the process of doing all of this. Would you like me to move this couch here or here? What do you think? But then I'm going to be making sure that photos are taking place. And like I said, um, I'm going to be attending at that time. Now, typically, I will also order my measurements through the photographer as well. Most people that do photography are also licensed to do measurements or organized to do measurements. Um, and it just makes things simple. Although we are trained on it in pre-licensing, it is something that I have always ordered from another vendor. As we get these items back, we are also going to be uploading them to MLS. Now, I know I gave you a reference for the stager. I'm going to do the same for photographers real quick. We have two that we highly recommend. One of them is Creative Impressions Media. They work with a lot of model homes and a lot of realtors. We also work with Harmon Property Solutions, same type of thing. For all of these, you can do both photos and measurements. When I say measurements, though, that does mean that you can get floor plans or you can get a virtual tour. So those little icons where it will allow you to click through the home and act like you are walking through it. You also have the option to order through those. Um, and they will typically let you order drone photography and things of that sort. As I get them back, I'm going to be uploading those oops, to MLS. Then I'm going to make a plan for getting my signs installed. <laughs> this is something that when I was an entry level agent, I did not do. I installed them myself. And let me tell you, learning from my own experiences, take them and use them for your own. Um, installing signs is not fun and it is a lot harder than it appears. I was sweating profusely for like 30 minutes, finally got it up and it was a little crooked. And it's a lot harder to get them out than it is to put them in. And so I finally um, called one of my friends who is a builder and just had him come out and do it. And then from then on, I hired Easy Sign to do it. I think it's like $35 for them to come in and install your sign. Now, obviously you don't have to have a sign, but I strongly think that you should. If you are in a town, if the listing is in a townhome community or any community that has an HOA, while you're communicating with that management company, go ahead and make sure you double check the covenants or ask them if there are any sign restrictions. My neighborhood, for instance, it's a little townhome community. They don't allow your big standard sign posts. They only allow the metal ones that kind of go into the ground and are almost square or a slightly smaller rectangular shape. So just make sure you have an understanding of that so that your sellers don't get fined, but go ahead and organize all of that. Then we're going to make a plan for activation. So we've gotten our sign installed or whatever. We have a plan for it. You can schedule it. We're going to be communicating with the sellers to make sure they understand what the plan is for showings. So I'm going to be saying, all right, if we're going to be activating this Friday, I'm going to set it so that as soon as someone requests a showing, they have access to it. Let's say my sellers are planning on being out of town or they've already moved out of the property and so it's vacant. Then I will be educating them on the fact that I'm going to be listing their home as what is called a go and show, meaning that as soon as someone requests an appointment, they will be able to get in the home and tour it. If they are currently living in the home, then I will make it appointment required, in which case, they will be notified anytime a showing is requested and they then have to respond either Y or N for yes or no to confirm or decline that showing. If they decline a showing, they need to tell me immediately what the alternative access availability is. I cannot sell your home if I cannot get people in the door. And so we need to be approving as many showings as possible. You just need to make sure your clients understand whether they are gonna have to take action and say yes or no, or whether it's automatically going to be approved. I'm going to be um, making sure I have a copy of the showing instructions, communicating that with my client and getting a lockbox on the property, either on the front door or on the front porch railing, whatever the case may be. Um, 
on the showing instructions note. I know I mentioned this last class, but just to say it again, especially if this is a vacant property, be proactive in communicating with your clients on how they expect the property to appear at the end of the day and how it should be presented regularly. So my last listing last year was going to be vacant. My clients had moved um, from Northeast Raleigh to South Apex, kind of like almost Willow Springs type area. And um, I always tell people, you know, I'm a strong believer, like if we can leave the blinds up and keep the lights on for showings, it just makes things simple, especially kind of in the winter months where it gets dark really early, no one likes to walk into a completely dark home. And so if we can kind of keep at least a few lights on, that's really nice. But that said, if it's a vacant home and we've got the blinds up and we've got the lights on, then at night, if people drive by, then they are going to see that it is vacant. And so we need to say, are you comfortable with that? Or would you rather us just keep the blinds closed? I strongly feel that rooms look a lot bigger and it presents a lot better when the blinds are open. But that said, I cannot guarantee that every morning I can go over and turn everything on and open the blinds. And every night I can go over and turn everything off. That's way too much. And that was a listing that was even close to me. And I felt that way. So we absolutely can't do those for listings that are 45 minutes away, for example. So just getting on the same page with our clients in terms of what they expect and how they want it presented. And then I'm going to do any last minute touches. Like I mentioned, I'm, I normally will add some white hand towels, add some um, little staging decorations like faux flowers on the mantle or maybe a few photos, for example. And then, like I said, we're organizing all of those details. Then I'm going to be sending them an updated email on what our benchmarks are. This very well could be similar to what we've already done, just eliminating the pho photography and stagers if that's already taken place, telling them when we're going to be activating, what that means in terms of showings. I might also be setting a plan with them in terms of how we are going to be reviewing offers. I like to just set that expectation with them. As offers come in, I will be sending them to you. I'll just go ahead and forward them along. But it's up to you whether you would like to review each offer individually as it comes in or whether you would like to set a deadline and say that on Sunday at 3 p.m. we're going to review all offers. Whatever the case may be, just make a plan with your sellers um, so that you're all on the same page because that will be a question that you get from buyer's agents. It's one that I've asked myself of, if I show this home today, my clients really like it. If we get you an offer, are your sellers the type of people that are willing to make a decision today? Or are they thinking they're going to wait the rest of the weekend? It's a question I'm going to get. So let's make sure we know the answer. Now, side disclosure here, I want to make sure I'm saying it because I'm a strong advocate for you guys and running your business in a way that makes you happy. This is where we set our expectations for the schedule that we want. So if we don't want to be working all weekend and we know that we've got a lot of showings coming up on Saturdays and we really try to keep Sundays to ourselves, let's not set an offer deadline of Sunday at 7 p.m. Instead, maybe let's try setting it for Monday at 10 a.m. I know it sounds a little bit different, but you are the one that gets to make the rules for the way that you operate your business. And so just keep that in mind. Keep in mind when you hope to be um, communicating with people. I know that after a long day, Sunday, people are then going to assume that we have an answer to them that evening, which means that I'm going to be discussing those offers with my sellers at 730. And I'm going to be getting, I'm going to be negotiating back and forth at eight and then getting things out at nine, right? Like, what a long weekend. And so that's totally fine if that's the way that things pan out, but just keep it in mind. We're good. Again, make sure they understand the plan for approval. There is an app that the sellers can have in terms of showing time. I'm not as familiar with it, but if you research it on the showing time um, section of MLS, you can find details on that. But the short version is once we are once we finish adding the listing, we will have the availability to add the seller's information. I will add their phone number and their email address to the notifications so that as requests come through, they will see them. And like I said, they can accept or decline. Now, as everything's ready, we're going to send them a copy of the final draft in MLS for their approval. So real quick, I'm going down a rabbit hole here. We've talked about MLS, but let's show you how you technically do that. So real quick, if you're in MLS, we typically live on the buy side right here. Instead, we're going to head on over to this section and you're going to put residential. Now, when you do that, it will take you to a page and allow you to start entering information. Anything that is required, 
you guessed it, it's got a red R next to it. As you go in, you can start typing information. Any fields that are available will start popping up below, or you can click the little uh, magnifying glass on the right hand side and see what all of the options are for each of the selections. Now, that said, as you're going through it, one thing to note, maybe I'm paranoid, I don't know. I will say that I always leave the status section completely blank until I am fully ready to activate because I'm paranoid that I'm going to put active in here and that although I'll save it as a partial by the time I activate it, it'll have days on market by accident or something. And so I always leave this off until I'm truly ready. But you can go through and start adding all of these details. Additionally, in the feature section, this is where at the bottom of any given listing, it will say, you know, HVAC zero to three years old or granite countertops or um, fenced yard. Those details, please add as much as possible here. I always prepare my buyers when I'm doing buyer consultations with them to say, I keep our search parameters pretty broad because there are some details that are not required to fill in. And if they're not filled in and that's a criteria that we have, then we will miss out on a property simply because the listing agent hasn't added those details. And so don't be that person, if at all possible. Honestly, in my opinion, the feature section is one of the easiest to fill out. And so if you have any trouble with it, just make a habit of as you're going through the home when you're in the listing presentation, just take a few photos of each room so that you know what the what the flooring finishes are in this room and what were the countertops in the kitchen and things like that. Additionally, you will have the option to add photos. My recommendation would be to add your primary photo first, then you can upload photos in bulk. I typically will do it in little groups because the issue is if you upload 50 photos, Although you can rearrange them while you're in here, that's a lot of work to do. And it's hard to move one all the way up, right? Especially if we need to move a lot of them. So just kind of keep that in mind. Now, do it however makes sense to you. In my opinion, the way that I like to present the photos is to provide a little teaser at the beginning and then make it act as if you were walking through the property. So I'll start with an exterior photo. I'll then typically do the living room kitchen and owner's bedroom or some statement feature. So if you've got some massive basement, for instance, add that. Or if, it, if there's a pool, make sure that that's one of the first few photos. Then I will start back out at the front of the property, do some additional exterior front angle side type photos. I'll go in and to the entry, dining room, living room, kitchen, whatever makes sense in terms of if you were walking through the property, this is what makes sense. I typically start with the common area, then I go into the owner's bedroom, and then I go into the secondary bedrooms, and then I make my way outside. Because although we've been in the home and it makes sense to us, if we jump around too much, it can be a little confusing to our clients. Now, the nice part is as you're doing all of this, and as you're entering information, you can view a detailed report, which will give you a sample of what it will look like once it's in MLS. And so as you start to fill this out, it's quite rewarding because you're like, oh, it's becoming real. It's all looking put together. I can't wait to activate it. Lastly, occasionally I'll have these conversations. I had two calls about this with some agents just last week. So I wanna make sure I mention it. If you were on the fence about how to price the home, let's say you're on the fence of, should I list it for four or 425? You can click this price analysis feature I would wait until you have the majority of the information in here. But if you click price analysis, it will tell you based on the agents and buyers that have searches set up in MLS, it will tell you how many potential buyers you have at that given price point. You can then go in and type in the other price that you're kind of playing around with in your head, and it will tell you an updated idea of how many buyers you have. So you can see if, well, it's pretty comparable, let's just leave it, or oh, wow, there's a dramatic difference if I make that change, in which case I might go to my sellers, take a little screenshot of this, of both numbers, and see what they want to do. All right, another, another benchmark, you guys. How's it going? How does this look? Has anyone played around with any of these yet? I, I will say, sorry, I'm right in the window, but I will say I am so grateful for this, um, Kate, because I have so much trouble with MLS. It just feels so unfriendly. 
And I thought, if I ever get a listing, I will not know what <laughs> an MLS. Imagine myself calling you. So I'm glad. I'm enjoying it. Good, good, good. I appreciate that. I will say it, it is quite intimidating and it is a little clunky looking, but don't let it intimidate you. Everything that you need to know, you have the answers to along the right hand side, or you can just call me. Um, as I'm going through it, I typically will just do all of the fields that are really easy. And the one that I dread the most every time without fail is the remark section. These are your little description um, for whatever reason. I mean, I'm a, I'm a pretty good writer, but it's not my strong suit you want to make sure that you kind of hit, hit the key points, but not too much. And so typically what I'll do is I'll talk about the functionality of the home, the main key points. Is it in a prime location or is it an ideal floor plan, a ranch with a, uh, a full bonus or a three-car garage or something like that? I'm going to list those details first. Then I'm going to talk about some of the finishes that will stand out. I typically will then end with any updates. So new carpet, HVAC replaced in 2018, new roof in 2020, light fixtures, right? Like I'm just doing a little list at the end. So I'll do that here. When I'm going to draft this to get excited and kind of get my thoughts in order, I typically will just have a little note off to the side and I'll just start typing out things that have caught my eye that I want to make sure I weave into this description. Now, as you will see here, there are limited characters. Now, the good news is this character limit has increased dramatically over the past two years. It used to be a lot lower, but just know that this is what we will see on MLS. Typically, though, this is what is published out when you send things through Zillow. So when you click active, unless you have put no for internet listing and internet address display, right? If you say yes to all of these, then it will automatically push out to places like Zillow and Realtor.com and any other third-party sites. It will take the syndication remarks as the new description. There is quite a difference between that character amount. So just make sure you understand that and make sure your clients understand it. So typically what I'll do is after I've done all of this, I'm gonna go over to view detailed report I'm going to click PDF, and then I'm going to download a copy of this. I will then upload this to Dot Loop and send it to my clients and say, hey, here's a copy of what we're working with. Do you have any edits that you would like to make? Please know that there are limited characters that I can use for the agent remarks or for the remarks section. If there are any tweaks that you'd like to make, I might have to remove something. So if you want me to add something, please tell me what you want me to remove. Now. That might not necessarily be the case, but I like to set that expectation for two reasons. One, I'm not saying write your entire description. I'm the listing agent. I want you to be happy, but I'm not giving creative liberties here too much. If they're a perfect writer, maybe. But in general, we're going to stick to what we know. But I also want them to know that I can't be adding every single detail. We do have limits. So just kind of keep that in mind. And keep in mind that we will, even if this one is perfectly written on MLS, we're going to have to somehow consolidate that down for when it's published out to third-party sites. And so um, I was really hesitant to do this when I was first getting into the business, but doing the, doing abbreviations um, for bedroom or F, FP for fireplace or a W with a slash for width. It seems silly and it seems um, honestly, in my opinion, a little unprofessional at first, but the more you read listing descriptions, the more you realize you just kind of have to, to fit everything in. So don't be too afraid of that. I typically will go ahead and just drop a signature at the top of it and just say, by the way, you know, once, once you've reviewed this, go ahead and sign it just so I know that you've seen it. Then whenever we've made an agreement for it to publish, we're going to go ahead and publish it to MLS. From there, it will push out to third-party sites. The thing to keep in mind, and I like to prepare my sellers for, is the fact that um, it will take a few hours for it to sync up with third-party sites. And so when I say it's published, I mean it, but it might be a little while until you see it on your end on sites like Zillow or Realtor. Once we've done that, we want to do the same thing we just did. We want to download it as a PDF once it's active and put it into Dot Loop as well for that exact reason. 
as soon as you say it's active, they are going to be on sites like Zillow and Realtor just refreshing the page. And they will text you saying, I don't see it yet. That's normal, even if you've prepped them on it. And so we want to make sure that we're adding this to dot loop and getting their signature on it to prove that we have activated at the time and date that we said that we would. Once we get signatures on those, we want to go ahead and make sure we submit that for review. Now, this is the key part here. While they are on the market, please, please, please communicate with your sellers. This is their largest asset. And who wants random people walking through their home all the time? And so if we're doing all of that, we absolutely want to know what they're thinking. Now, we do need to prep them and say that sometimes, you know, no news and no offers is the feedback. Not everyone is going to give feedback. But as much as we can, as we get feedback from people, as we're talking with, sell or with agents after their showings, we want to be passing that information along. We also want to make sure that we are reviewing the feedback that comes back. When you have a listing, automatically you will have feedback um, that it, a feedback request that is sent out to any agent that has shown your home. And I actually like what is standard. It kind of gives you, and unfortunately I can't show it because it only allows it once you've activated something, but it has a ranking system. And so it will say, how does this listing compare to the others you've seen? Zero to five. Um, how do you feel it is priced? What was the condition? And in terms of pricing, it'll say too low, too high, or just right. And so this can be very valuable information if there is a conversation you've been trying to have with your sellers and maybe not being able to get through on. If, for instance, you feel that it might be a little too high in terms of price, and then that starts to be the feedback that you're getting. And you've kind of warned them that, hey, we can feel it out for a little bit, but you know, if we don't get any traction, we might need to go ahead and lower it by the second weekend. If you start getting that feedback, proactively start sending it to them because it backs up these conversations. If at any point you see that there is a, a decline like that your sellers have declined a showing, again, make sure you're reaching out to them and getting an alternative to that appointment as quickly as possible. Um, also, you know, it depends on the situation. I will say though, on the weekends, although I said I can't go over there every day, if at all possible, on the weekends, I do try to go over at the end of at least one or two of the days on Friday and Saturday or whatever days seem to have the most showings and just check on the property. If I've left shoe covers in the home, for instance, I definitely want to be doing that because as much as we are courteous in homes, not everyone is. And so there's nothing worse than walking in and having shoe covers everywhere and that being someone's first impression. Um, and same thing with the sign. I think I kind of mentioned that earlier, but when it comes to installing them, you know, people, first impressions matter. And the way that things appear when you first look at them whether we realize it or not, says a lot about how we feel that people have maintained other things. And so if our sign is leaning, then is that the listing agent that's really on top of everything? Same thing goes for what our clients are doing, which is why staging is so important. Um, if there's stuff all over and they very easily could have put it under, are they the type of people that also got their HVAC serviced? And so just kind of keep that in mind, but that's also why I will go to the property after showings. I just want to make sure that everything kind of looks in place. Now, if it's far away, try to see what agent friend you have that's in that area and just saying, hey, can I, can I throw you $20? Would you mind just popping over to this house and just checking on it and turning off the lights or uh, picking up any shoe covers if needed? As you get questions from agents, be sure to respond. I typically, when I am when I have a given listing, I will just draft a canned text and have it in my note section and just say, hey, and I'll leave it blank so I can type in the agent's name. Thank you so much for scheduling a showing at my listing. We look forward to having you tour it. If you have any questions or, or questions while you're in the home or afterwards, please don't hesitate to reach out. We look forward to hearing from you or something like that. Because Yes, they absolutely will have my information on the bottom of that MLS sheet, but I want them to know that if they need anything, I'm right here. And I want them to know that I'm a good agent to work with. And so if they have any questions, they're a lot more likely to text me real quick um, than they would be to dig through all their paperwork. So just kind of keep that in mind. As we get those offers, we're going to be sending them to the sellers like we talked about. I tell that if they do have a plan to review the offers later, I'm going to say, hey, it's my job. I'm required to send you a copy of each offer as we get them. But just know, 
Um, we're going to make a plan to review all of them together later. So absolutely continue to look through all of this, but just know we'll circle back and talk about them later. Then once we have a plan for reviewing offers, we're going to stick with that. If we have a deadline that we've set, please be sure to put that information everywhere. That means we're putting it in the agent remarks, telling them, you know, offered at first, that should be the first thing in your agent remarks section. Offer deadline is 10 a.m. on Monday. I'm also going to be adding it to the showing instructions. I'm going to likely text or email any party that is currently waiting. And it's a delicate dance when we are trying to decide with our sellers whether we want to have an offer deadline or not, because you want to respect the people that were there first. But we also don't want to be rushed, especially if we're in a seller's market. So um, if you plan on setting an offer deadline, I would recommend putting that in place as soon as your listing goes active. Um, that said, when we go to review offers, I typically, I typically will do something of this sort where I will make a spreadsheet with the offer number the price, and when I say this offer number, I'm typically referring to, I'll, I'll do it two ways. I'll make one spreadsheet that is literally the order in which they are received. I will then make another spreadsheet where I copy that information and then sort it by highest purchase price so that it's easy to show to the sellers. But then I'll go through and add purchase price, due diligence, earnest money, the important dates, the type of financing they're getting, the lender that they're using, and any additional information that might be needed whether they add in an appraisal addendum, how much they're putting as a down payment, do they want anything else? Are they making any other asks? And then I'll also put the agent just for my own reference. Then as I'm going through this, I'll be able to talk with them about the different aspects of everything. Obviously purchase price being the highest is the most important, but we should also talk about the different types of financing. If we have two offers that are the same, but they have different financing, what does that mean? Or if they are hand in hand, they've got the same offers, but one is 0% down or one is 10% down. What does that mean? What are we comfortable with? And just kind of making sure we have all of that together. Now, as we're getting these offers back, um, please, please, please be sure that you are not only looking at the email that they have sent you, but also looking at all of the attached documents. I personally use a template for submitting my offers that bullet points each of those terms. I am very diligent about making sure that I'm updating everything, but we are all human. And so even if they have that type of outline, make sure you're looking through every page of the contract and that you are referencing each line item and putting that in your spreadsheet so that you don't have anything kind of slide under your radar, that they didn't send you some overview with everything that they're asking, but forget to put on there or forget intentionally to put on there that they're asking for $3,000 in closing costs or something like that. And then you go over all of these offers and your sellers accept that one and you guys didn't realize that, that's on you as an agent. So just make sure you're double checking everything. Also make sure that when we are presenting this information, we are following fair housing guidelines. You saw that I said offer one, offer two, offer three. I'm not putting people's names. I'm strictly putting the offer number. We wanna make sure that we're, we're staying in line. We do have a spreadsheet for that. Um, also, one of the things that I will do is if there seems to be an offer or two that's really standing out, you might get a handful of offers that are pretty similar and there might be one that's just out of this world and you're like, I would be shocked if they didn't take this offer. I'm gonna go ahead and use the seller estimate sheet, which will take the current sales price, subtracting their, their current payoff, and then any costs that they can potentially incur, including commissions and attorney fees, and it shows them what their estimated balance is. I'm gonna do that for their top few offers so that they can really see how that will impact their bottom line. Then we're gonna present it all to them. Make sure, I know I say it all the time, I, you're probably sick of hearing it from me, but we do this every day. This is not an everyday decision for them. So things that we take for granted, things that seem incredibly obvious to us, 
are not always obvious to them. So make sure that as we're reviewing these offers, we're really explaining to them each of those details. What does it mean if there's an offer that has a higher due diligence than another? It means they're less likely to walk away. It means they have more to lose. It means they're more invested. That's kind of a key term. And so if we have Let's say we've got one offer that's at 400 and it's got $10,000 due diligence. And we have another offer that's 405 and it has $1,000 due diligence. I might would actually recommend the other one, but it's up to them. Make sure they understand what those differences are. If they have a higher down payment, it means that if it doesn't appraise, they likely have more cash on hand that they could use to bridge that appraisal gap, which means they're less likely to walk away. Things like that. Then, and, and make sure, this is something that a lot of people don't know, make sure that they know, as terrible as it sounds, sellers cannot terminate, only buyers can. And so once we are under contract, we are under contract. And so what you select, we need to be really comfortable in. Once they've decided, we want to get seller signatures. Now, that said, chain of command is very important here. If there are any counters we want to make, we are having that communication with the buyer's agent. And the buy side is updating their offer and getting us an updated offer. And then we are signing it. So I'm not taking their offer. Let's say that, you know, they came in at 400, the other one's at four or five. And so we just counter. We're like, we want to work with you guys. We really like your terms, but we're countering at 405. And they say, yes, I as the list side am not going into that document, striking through and putting 405 and then having everyone initial on my side and then sending it back. No, no, no. I want the sellers to always have the final hand in terms of waiting on signatures, because what we don't want to have happen is have everyone on the same page. It feels great. We're so excited. This is going to be an amazing transaction. Everyone's ready to work with one another. We get these documents, you know, sellers sign their side of things. We make one small tweak, which means that it's not a true contract because terms have changed. We send it back to the buy side and then we are sitting and waiting. And we have eight other people that we may have already said, oh, we accepted another offer or two. And these people take forever to sign. And then what do you know? They walk away, right? So absolutely make sure that they are doing these things and getting it to you. Chain of command is very important. Also, this little side note, um, you know, getting personal checks is, is very standard. If at all possible, do try to encourage the buy side to get you certified funds though, because then it makes sure that it clears immediately. I'm trying to think if there was anything else I wanted to kind of add. Okay circle back as I think of it. Next, so, okay, let's take a step back. As we get all of these, we want to make sure, I, don't, I thought I said it somewhere, maybe not. Um, let's not burn any bridges. It is not done until it is done. And so as we are getting these offers in hand and we're communicating with everyone and then we start communicating back um, and we start to make a decision once we've decided and have signatures, please be sure to communicate with everyone, you need to be sending out a notification in MLS. You also need to be texting those agents that have been texting you. There is nothing worse as a buyer's agent when you feel like you have a great relationship with the list side and you're like, man, I hope I get it. And then, and your buyers are texting you frequently saying, hey, do you have any updates? Do you have any updates? And you're like, I don't, I think it's looking good though. And then out of nowhere, you see that the status has changed in MLS and you haven't heard anything from that agent please be sure on the list side to text them, just say, hey, I'm so sorry. Unfortunately, we've decided to go with another one. Um, try to give them a little feedback if you can. Now, we want to be careful not to disclose other people's offers, but you can always say things like, you know, the due diligence was incredibly important to them. They went with an offer that had a stronger due diligence. It gives that buyer's agent an opportunity to give feedback to her clients. And again, it's not done until it's done. And so God forbid our contract falls out. We want to make sure that we still have those relationships with the agents and we haven't burned any bridges. Does anyone, I know it sounds like most people here are kind of new to the list side, but does anyone have experiences like this on the buy side? Where maybe you've had an offer accepted or you felt it was really good and the communication just dropped off, or maybe it was a good experience, but you still didn't win it or anything like that you want to share? Well, once you're under contract, okay, I was like, I feel like we're missing something here. All right, once we're under contract, as we're having this conversation, first and foremost, congratulate your people. They did it. They worked incredibly hard to get their home ready. It looked amazing. They had a ton of showings. Thank you so much for accommodating everyone. I know it's 
exhausting to have people in your home constantly. Congratulations, you're now under contract. Now, on the list side, we kind of just sit back and wait for everything on the buy side to take place. However, we need to make sure that you know that from here, the buyers are gonna order their inspections and their appraisal. And we as the seller need to give them access for these things within reason. Now, if they start requesting 10 show or 10 appointments in the next few days, we're going to have a conversation with them. But within good reason, we need to provide reasonable access to the property for these items. And so if there is anything um, that we need to decline, please, please, please let us know immediately when we can counter that and make sure we're keeping in mind what our due diligence date is. So if we've got a due diligence date of two weeks and the buyers that we've accepted are incredibly on top of it and they request an inspection for two days from now and that doesn't work for you and you counter with some date over here. Well, a few things when you're kind of putting them in a tight situation and we need to recognize that we might then need to extend due diligence just to be fair because we can't say no to accommodating them here and then rush them over here. So just keep those things in mind. Also, I said it in my last class, but we need to be uh, mindful of how much our sellers are in the home. If this home is vacant, it doesn't really matter too much. But if they have pets, if they work from home, we need to keep in mind that we really need to be providing privacy during these times. Yes, you can technically be there, but like, ew, I hate when I show up to an inspection and the sellers are there. How uncomfortable, right? Um, so make sure they know that they need to vacate their property. And if they work from home or something of that sort, we need to have a plan in place. I mentioned it last class, but one of my sellers, that one that I showed um, the before and after staging photos for, he worked from home and I didn't know that he had such like strict security for his job. And so he could not go work from a coffee shop or random places. Um, he had to be, his internet security had to be really tight. And so that was going to be really difficult. And, you know, inspectors don't work in the evenings. We can't wait until work is done. So all of that to say, make sure you're having the conversation. Then here we go. Maybe I should move that slide up one. Once we've got that done, we're going to communicate news to everyone. We're going to send an executed contract to the buyer's agent once our sellers have signed. We're going to add a copy of that executed contract to our dot loop. We're going to call that agent to confirm receipt and to congratulate them. Congratulations, you guys. We've accepted your offer. We're so incredibly excited to work with you. Um, when can I meet up with you to go ahead and get those due diligence check, that due diligence check? Right. I'm setting the expectation like, that's great. Let's get the money. Um, I'm also going to send out a notice through showing time. And like I said, I'm going to be texting those other agents to let them know. Don't want to be burning any bridges. I also need to make sure that I change it to pending in MLS. And this is an easy one to forget. Cancel all remaining showings. Once things go into pending, you have that as an option. Be sure to do it. There is nothing worse than forgetting to do that. And understandably, your sellers are not thinking of it. It's not on their radar. And out of nowhere, especially if they're working from home, some random person walks in the door and they're like, oh, we had an appointment confirmed. And maybe that agent just didn't double check. Maybe they printed their MLS sheets a few days ago before it was under contract. So make sure that you do that and make a plan for checks. Real quick, since we're jumping around a good bit here, I'm gonna show you on MLS. When you're putting all of this information in, once you go under contract, you see this little sold section, you will then come in and you are going to add that agent's information. We also are going to change the status here from active to pending. And when you do that, I do think there are gonna be some additional fields that will pop up. It will have you put in the due diligence date, and the closing date, due diligence date is not required. Um, however, I do like to put that in there just because if there's anyone that was really interested in the property, I want them to keep an eye on it for that amount of time in the off chance that we come back to market. And then, like I said, we're going to be uploading all of those to dot loop. And we're going to make sure that we submit it for review. And then we're going to make the under contract arrangements. Now, rest easy. I know I'm going through a lot and I know this is a lot of steps, but just know that after this, it kind of gets easier. Um, we're going to make a plan to get that check from the buyer's agent. We're going to sign the page 15, which confirms the receipt of that. We're then going to take that check to the sellers and get their signature on page 15. We're going to send page 15 back to the buyer's agent. 
and we're going to send a copy of the contract disclosures and page 15 to the attorney. Now, typically the buy side is going to do that, but not everyone's on top of it and I'm not going to make any assumptions. So I'm always going to be sending that to the attorney just in case. I likely will have to confirm with the buyer's agent just to make sure that we're on the same page of what attorney we're working with, but definitely food for thought. Then I'm going to pass along. Once I do that, I will get a copy of the seller authorization sheet from the attorney. When I get that, I'm typically dropping it into dot loop and I'm filling out as much information as I know. Um, I typically will not fill out the seller's names just because if their full legal name is something other than what I have in my contract, I don't want to be presumptuous. It will have it will ask them for their marital status, which will therefore help the attorney determine the type of ownership type that needs to be conveyed or that they need to close out. Um, also, obviously not so well. Side note, I'm going to be putting in the commission information, how much I as a listing agent am going to be getting, how much the buyer's agent is going to get, et cetera. But the thing that I'm preparing my clients for um, is I'm going to be making sure that they understand social security numbers are on this document. It is totally normal. Don't fret. Um, so with that in mind, when you fill this out, just go ahead and email it straight to the attorney. You don't need to send it to me, but do send me an email or a text letting me know that you've sent it over. That way I can follow up. But, you know, for security reason, you can go ahead and just not copy me on it. Just know that the, the social security information is a very standard request. Amy asked, when listing your own property, do you follow the same process or do you adjust? I follow it. I follow it as much as I can. Is there anything specific you're referencing, Amy? that you might make adjustments for you were wondering about? No, just trying to research because we'll have to put our own home on the market in a few months. Yeah, that's basically the same. Yep. And honestly, it'll be quite a refresher for you because it'll let you know how the how the clients feel. I know we deal with a lot of emotions, but you certainly understand what you did. But yep, do the same thing. Then easy to forget. Ugh, I always forget about my signs, y'all. Speaking from personal experience, make sure you make a plan for having your sign changed out. Typically, most signs will have like a for sale or listed information with the agent's name, maybe a photo, phone number, email. And then I will have a writer at the top that says just listed or active or for sale. Typically, once it goes under contract, I will then have the sign company go out and install an under contract writer. I do this because I like the neighbors to see how quickly it's under contract. And so they know that we are getting it sold. Um, other agents have the perspective that they want to leave the for sale rider up because they want people to continue to call that sign number and continue to inquire about it, maybe continue to gather potential buyer leads, use your best judgment and whatever practice works for you and your business. But I typically will order that. Um, again, I use easy sign for this. Typically, I think they charge about 15 to $20 to go out there. So it's not too much. Um, but it is convenient. Then we're going to sit back and wait. I always like to tell my sellers, we've been talking a lot the past few weeks, just know we're going to sit back and wait while they order their inspections and appraisal and have all of that performed. Just know that no news is good news. I know after we've been talking for a while, it can seem like we're missing something when we're not talking as regularly, but that's okay. At any point, that said though, at any point, if you have any questions, let me know. Now, one thing I didn't put on here when we're talking about all of this plan is although we're going to be sitting back and waiting, I want us to be on the same page as in terms of when we're going to pack. Um, it's up to you as a seller. However, my recommendation as an agent is that we wait to start truly packing until after due diligence. I'm a little bit superstitious and I also just don't want to have to redo anything. Um, if God forbid, for some reason, we have to go back to market, maybe not even to any fault of our own. Maybe it has something to do with the buyer's financing. But if we have to go back on the market at any point, I don't really want us to be back on the market with boxes everywhere or do you, for you to feel like you have to do all of these other things to, to feel ready to accommodate showings again. So just know that and tell them, you know, if, if at all possible, please wait to truly pack until after due diligence. If there's anything like in the cabinets that you want to go ahead and pack, by all means, um, but just kind of keep that in mind. And then also just know that in terms of moving out, we need to be out of the home by 9 a.m. at the latest on the day of closing. So making sure that they know to schedule movers accordingly. And they're going to do all of those things. We're going to accommodate their appointments. And then depending on the results of them, we very well will likely end up negotiating. 
This can happen in a number of ways. If you've been on the buy side, you know this. Sometimes it will happen all at once. They might do their inspection and their appraisal. The appraisal might be totally fine. So they just go ahead and negotiate based on the inspection items. Maybe it, there are a few small inspection items and it didn't appraise. So they're asking for some closing costs altogether or they're just, it, or maybe it didn't appraise by a good bit. And so they're just not even worried about the inspection, but they're definitely negotiating based on the appraisal. Whatever the case may be, we are negotiating with them. Now, a few things to keep in mind. Um, one, sellers don't have to do anything, right? <laughs> I know we say to the buy side all the time and it kind of stinks, but it's true. The sellers are not required to make any repairs. That said, we all have the same goal to get to closing. And so if they are asking for something, especially if it's something small, let's work with them on that. This is not HGTV. This is not some Bravo show. We are not here to negotiate tooth and nail and make it look like we're some big bad listing agent who's going to fight for everything. Absolutely. We want to be working for our clients, but let's make this an enjoyable experience for everyone. Um, and so let's just kind of see what would get us to closing. I had a situation where one of my listings um, was very well maintained, very minimal inspection report. Um, and the buyers were asking for like a $200 credit for some stuff in the bathroom. Like the tile work was uneven and they were worried that it was related to uneven flooring. It's one of those things where like, it's so small, really, we don't have to say yes to this, but it might be worth it. Just throwing things out there to people and reminding them, especially if they've recently been a buyer or they're about to be a buyer, just reminding them of those situations. Again, once we do that, okay, so as we're getting negotiations, this can happen in one of two ways. We will either get a due diligence repair agreement, in which case they're going to send over their inspection report and a list of any item that they are truly kind of worried about or that they're hoping for repairs on. They will list the repair that they are interested in, in which case we will need to coordinate with vendors to get those done prior to closing with receipt. It does need to be a licensed professional. Um, if it is not a licensed professional, we need to make sure that the buy side knows that. If your dad is a handyman, and that's who's going to be doing the repairs, make sure they know that so that you don't run into some situation right before closing. The other side of things, though, is you might get an agreement to amend, um, in which case they can lower the purchase price or ask for closing costs. That's nice and easy because you're just signing on the dotted line. If they do go that route, they, they on the buy side are going to want to make sure they get a copy of that to the attorney and lender. But just know if you're negotiating repairs, you need to keep in mind we need to get those repairs done before closing. Has anyone had any situations along those lines on the buy side, maybe, or on the sale side, if you've had any, I'm trying to see who's on here, any tricky repairs? I have. Who is that? Editorial, what was your situation and did it get um, So it was a couple things, um, like some water stains um, from leakage on the roof and then the carbon monoxide and smoke detectors. Um, were hanging out of the ceiling, like the wires weren't connected. And they were kind of giving us some pushback saying, well, you should get new ones anyways, which I agree with, but we want to make sure they're functional. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a delicate dance. Always is. Thanks for sharing. I'm trying to think of if I had any. I haven't really had too many that were crazy, but I have had a few buyers that were negotiating um, like crawl space type items. And so they had like three vendors come out and they're like, well, this one's $14,000. Let's send them this one. And you're like, okay, just because it's higher doesn't mean they have to go for it anymore. You know, <laughs> but you just play it by ear. Um, do you know on that note that if they submit something that your clients are a little bit iffy about, your sellers do have the option to hire their own vendors to get a quote. So on let's use that as an example. Let's say the crawl space shows some moisture. They get a few vendors out there that say, oh, it needs a sump pump and it needs a French drain and whatever. And that total is going to be $10,000. You're like, man, that seems steep. Absolutely. Your sellers can then hire another vendor to come out and give another quote. They would then be the ones that need to pay for it. Your sellers need to pay to have that quote done if that's if there's some trip charge, um, and they can use that as a benchmark to the encounter. But just know if your sellers are going to be exploring that additionally, that needs to take place during due diligence. So if we get that request right at the end of due diligence, we don't really have time to accommodate that vendor. Just kind of keep that in mind. 
Anything that we negotiate, though, we're going to be getting in writing and making sure that we have signatures on all of that and uploading it to our loop. Again, you know the deal. We're submitting it for review. Now, I also eh, send a copy to the attorney if needed. We're then going to make a plan for closing. I like to tell my people now that due diligence is wrapped up, you're in the home stretch. The attorney and the lender are going to continue to fi finalize the buyer's file. The attorney is going to continue doing title work and make sure everything looks good to go. If they have any questions, they will absolutely reach out. But now your job is to pack. Go ahead and start doing all of that. Um, now, this is also where we remind our clients that we want to make sure that the home is clean by the time we leave, not just moved out, but clean. And so if you're really good at cleaning, by all means, but I would recommend maybe having it professionally cleaned. Here's a few vendors that I recommend. Technically, you know, side note between us, technically, according to the contract, the home just needs to be broom cleaned. But in my opinion, that's not very clean, right? So if at all possible, just give a little nudge and see if we can get that professionally done. Um, also, one thing to note, when people are submitting an offer, they can include an ad, um, additional provisions addendum, which can state additional items they'd like to have done as a part of their initial offer. So one of the things that I've seen in that is, you know, home to be professionally cleaned prior to closing or home to have carpets professionally shampooed prior to closing. If there is anything that has been attached to that contract, make sure we're also doing that. We're going to make a plan for the buyer's final walkthrough. So I'm going to be touching base with the buyer's agent to say, hey, when do you plan to do that? Are you thinking you'll do it the morning of closing? Are you planning on going the evening before? If it's the day before, make sure that you set the expectation with them of how packed your seller is going to be. Like, all right, well, you know, they're they're going to be truly moving out the morning of closing. They're going to be sleeping on a mattress on the floor. So when you come in, there might be a few boxes, but just know that they're in the home stretch. Or if they're going the morning up, everything should be out. Also, I want to be using that as a time to continue to check in on the buyer's loan. Everything's still looking good for the loan. Are there any concerns that the lender has? How's our timeline looking? I'm also going to continue to advise my clients on packing. Again, making sure they understand when they have to be out. Ooh, this is a good one. I didn't mention it earlier. Make sure your clients understand what the plan is for utilities, especially if they are out of the house already. We need to keep utilities in our name and turned on until the day of closing. Have them transferred out of your name on the day of closing, not the day before, not weeks before the day of. We also want to be providing a copy of all utility information to the buy side so they know where they need to go to turn on gas and power and who is doing trash and water. Also, you guessed it, don't forget about your signs. Make sure you reach out to your sign company and schedule to have that sign removed. Or if you're going to do it yourself, just make sure it doesn't fall off the radar. Um, on that note, if you plan on removing the sign yourself, as silly as it sounds, I would recommend bringing one of those large gallons of water. Um, if it's really hard, like if the ground is really hard, it can be really difficult to remove that sign. And so as silly as it sounds, pouring water near the base of the signpost can really help loosen it up. Just random note. Again, we're going to continue to check on the buy side. Now, according to nationwide lending regulations, no later than three days prior to closing, the buyers must receive a copy of the preliminary closing disclosure. If they they must receive and acknowledge it. If they miss that benchmark, closing will be delayed. So therefore, I am making sure that I'm continuing to push on the buy side to see when this is going to go out. We know that this is a three-day minimum. And so if we on the list side are not keeping an eye on this and we get one day away from closing and we're touching base with the buy side and saying, hey, how's everything looking for tomorrow? And they're like, oh, the preliminary CD didn't go out. We actually can't close until two days from now. And you don't know that and you're just now communicating that to the sellers, not a good look. So as much as we can communicate, we need to communicate. Then once the numbers match with the lender and the attorney, we are going to get a copy of the CD as the agent first normally. Um, and once we get that, we're going to review the numbers. Really though, that is our job. I know I've said it before, but I will say it again. It is not our job to simply look at our commission. We need to make sure that everything looks correct. We need to make sure that their names are spelled correctly at the very top, that the closing date at the top is also correct, that their address is correct to make sure that that 
proper property is conveying. We then need to go short, go through and make sure that the sales price is correct and both of those deposits, due diligence, earnest money are properly being credited to the buyers. If there's any repairs that we are doing concessions for, or if there were any seller paid closing costs that were previously agreed upon, maybe even at the time of offer, we need to make sure that that is reflected in there. Typically, what I will do is I have a software called Loom. It's just a screen recording software where it also will have your little face icon in the bottom. And so what I typically will do is I'll do a screen recording and I'll go through that document and then I'll send them that link and just say, hey guys, I'm gonna send you an email with a copy of your document, but just know here's a quick review of it. The attorney will go over it together with us at closing, but I just wanna make sure everything looks good on your end. On my end, I saw that X, Y, and Z um, looks good or I noticed that you know they hadn't put the home warranty on there and that was something that was a part of our offer. So I'm gonna make sure I respond to the attorney with that. Do you have any edits? Um, you know, it's kind of a delicate dance because if it's some credit that the buy side wants, you know, if it's overlooked, once it's signed, it's done. But like that is not the way to do your business. So please, if you see something that's wrong, please be sure to say it on the front end. Then Again, we're gonna be finalizing the plan for the walkthrough. Now, it's not just as simple as when are you doing it? We also need to be communicating what the plan is for keys, right? So at some point, I need to be getting that lockbox off the door, but I can't do it before they've done their final walkthrough. Otherwise, they're not gonna have keys to do the walkthrough with. And so if they are doing that walkthrough, um, I might have that buyer's agent not only take those keys with them, but maybe even take the lockbox and bring both of those to closing. Or maybe I'll say, yeah, you can bring the keys with you. Um, please be sure you don't give it to your client until it records, but I'll go out and get the lockbox off the property when I remove the staging details, you know, tomorrow night or whatever the case is right before closing. Also remind your sellers to disconnect anything. That said, also please be sure to remind them to empty their icebox, <laughs> um, especially if it's one of the ones that's in the front of the fridge door, because if there is any lapse in power, that ice can melt and leak all over the floor. And that's not what people wanna walk into. Again, we wanna make sure they know how to access the house. And then we close. Now, seller signatures are much better <laughs> than buyer signatures. Seller signatures only take like 10 minutes. They can take place in advance. And so your sellers can arrange to meet with the attorney at, few days, even a week or two before closing and go ahead and sign most of their documents. If they sign in advance, they will also sign a limited power of attorney for you as their agent to finish signing on their behalf on the day of closing. Otherwise, they're going to be coming on the day of closing. Typically, they will come 10 minutes before the buy side and they'll sign and then the buyers will sign. Now, on a side note, we always upload all of our documents, our Alta and our closing disclosure to dot loop to submit for review after it's been signed at closing. However, if we are signing on our client's behalf, we need to make sure that as soon as we have a copy of that finalized closing disclosure, we are uploading it to our dot loop and having them electronically sign it. I need them to know that their signature on this confirms that everything looks good to go. All of these numbers are correct and that their signature gives my gives me approval to sign on their behalf on the day of closing. It's not, you know, it, once, once you sign, it's done. And so if I sign on their behalf and those numbers aren't right and they haven't seen those numbers and they haven't said as much, whoo, honey, I'm in trouble. Don't end up in that situation. So make sure that you are having them sign it. Once they record, they are officially closed, at which point their funds will be ready. Um, they can either go by the attorney's office and pick up a check. The attorneys can mail them a check or they can do a wire transfer normally for like $25 or $35. It's whatever works best for them. Then we want to make sure we get paid, right? So we're going to take all of those documents and upload it to dot loop. We need to be going into MLS and updating it to closed. When we do that, same area that I showed you before of the sold section, it is going to ask for the purchase price. It's going to ask if there were any financial concessions made um, and things of that sort. So we need to make sure that we're updating all of that information. This is useful for other people that are looking to comp out properties to see, you know, maybe in this neighborhood, it's pretty common for people to get $2,000 in closing costs or something of that sort. So make sure you add those details. We're going to download a copy of the closed MLS sheet to Dotloop, 
And then we're going to submit that for review. We also want to make sure, like I said, we're coordinating that sign removal and then submit it. And from there, you should be good to go. If at any point you don't start seeing that paycheck in the next few days, uh, be sure that you're you're checking in your dot loop. There might be something missing. A few things to note here. Okay, well, before I go into any of that, I know I did a long checklist, done a lot of talking. How are you guys doing? Is there anything that caught your eye that you really have a question about? Or is there anything that you saw in here that's kind of surprising um, or maybe even different from what you've experienced on the buy side? All right, y'all, I must be nailing it, huh? All right, let me know if you think of anything. A few things to note. As we get towards the end of this, I like to make sure it doesn't just end here, right? After closing, this relationship, first and foremost, this relationship is not done after closing. You are now a past client of mine, which means that I'm going to continue to check in on you. I want to make sure that you're doing well. If you have any real estate related questions, please know I'm still here to be a resource. Our relationship doesn't end here. In the meantime, though, I would like to ask for a review. And so I do send them kind of a standardized email. I typically will wait about a week or so after closing to send this to them. Because let's be real, they're not going to do it when they're surrounded by boxes. So I don't want to have to worry about them remembering, like opening it when they're in the middle of things and hoping that they circle back. So I'm going to send it to them once they might have unpacked slightly. Um, and I do have a template for this. I'll send it out to you guys later. But come on, I'll show it to you in the meantime. I typically will do something along these lines. I'll say, May I ask a quick favor? Congratulations again. I hope you're settling in nicely. I think this was a buyer, but same type of thing for sellers. Um, I want to say thank you so much again for the opportunity to represent you. I know this is a big decision. It can be intimidating to know who to use. I'm honored that we were able to work together. Thank you so much for your business. Um, also, though, I wanted to reach out to ask a quick favor. As silly as it sounds, you know, online reviews really matter. And it's one of the best ways I can continue to increase my business. The more people I can have shouting my name from the mountaintops, um, the more I can be of service to our community. So if you don't mind, would you write a review below or a few links? And then I'll put, put in parentheses. If you, you know, if you want to write a few of them, just feel free to copy and paste, but any would be appreciated. People love to be asked to help you. And most of the time they're more than happy to do this. We just got to point them in the right direction. And it's a nice touch point after closing, a good little check-in. Reminder, utilities should be kept on through the day of closing. Also, ooh, this was something I did not mention when we were talking about coordinating for showings. We need to make sure we're explaining security systems. Um, twofold, one, if you have a security system, where are you in that contract? If you have ordered some security system that has some annual contract or some large amount attached to it that you're currently paying off, that is your financial burden at closing. We need to finish paying that off. We can't simply transfer it to buy to the buyer and be like, well, <laughs> yours now. No, we need to make sure that we finish that out or have it removed. So make sure you're explaining that to them. Additionally, we need to make sure they know that um, if there are cameras in the home or on the outside of the home, they can absolutely look, absolutely look but they cannot listen. It is against the law for them to listen to people in their home. I know it sounds crazy, but you cannot do it. Also, any smart systems it should be a part of the contract. It's part of their listing agreement when they're going into this. But let's be real, most people don't read most of that as much as we encourage them to. So reminder that any smart systems, like a ring doorbell, a Nest thermostat, they will automatically convey with the home. So if we don't want them to, um, we need to, at the very least, say as much. But at the most, go ahead and just take those down and replace them. If there is anything that they don't want to convey with the property, my main advice would be to just go ahead and have it be removed before showing so there's no confusion. Also, in preparation for showings, reminder to vacate during showings, make a plan for the thermostat and the blinds, right? If you walk in and you're like, it's freezing in here. It's great that your AC works, but maybe we'll bump it up a touch for showings or vice versa. We need to prep them that people might not always leave feedback. That's okay. I will I will push them. I'll see if I can get any feedback. But again, sometimes no feedback is the feedback. If they are interested, there will be an offer in our inbox. That said, this is the main one. I want to make sure we 
touch on, I want to make sure we get comfortable with. It can be an uncomfortable conversation if we make it uncomfortable. But here's the thing, this is part of our job. And so as we're preparing for showings, I like to make sure they know um, anything that is in the home that could be seen as dangerous or can be taken advantage of, we need to be either completely removing from the property or at the very least putting it away and locking it. As we're as I finish up the listing presentation, as I get ready to list, I'm saying, hey, by the way, that you know, that knife block on the counter, beautiful knife set, go ahead and prepack that. We don't want anyone to have access to it. Um, I also like to get in the habit of saying, hey, are there any firearms in the home? I need to know. It's a it's a liability. I need to understand if there's firearms in the home. If there are, they need to be put in a gun safe. If you don't have a gun safe, they need to be removed from the property for showings. Same thing with prescriptions. Don't just leave them in your cabinets. They need to be locked somewhere and you need to take them. And same thing with jewelry. Ideally, agents are keeping an eye on everyone and everyone does right. But, you know, you occasionally do have a situation and we don't, we want to be proactive against it. So, okay. I've talked a lot. Those are kind of all of my um, ideas. Thanks, Marcia, for hopping on. Appreciate your time. I know you got to run. Did anyone else have any questions about anything that we went over? Any amazing takeaways that you want to add or any questions that you have? Um, I just wanted to uh, say that was a really nice job, uh, the flow of that and how organized. Um, and I hope that you'll send us a copy of it. Uh, or at least the notes, but um, there were two things that have happened to me in my listings that um, I just wanted to share so nobody else makes the same mistakes. <laughs> Please. Um, so um, I had a situation with the HVAC and I was very zealous and wanting to do a great job in my narrative for that MLS thing. And so I took the R pods and wrote right on there what my seller, you know, because it was just, uh, of course, she wouldn't get it wrong or make a mistake or make up something so she said the hvac was 2018 i said the hvac was 2018 i went out and looked at the date plate it was a scramble of numbers i thought yeah i need to run those numbers and see because some of them you know how they're very easy and then others are you know kind of a crapshoot so i thought i need to run those i did not and so it was on me because guess who put in the narrative hvac 2018 i put that in my and it came back to bite me because it was actually we were under contract and um, they said, the inspector said the, the HVAC was 2015. And I was just like, okay, well, it's working. It's, you know, it's whatever. Uh, well, I didn't see that it was an issue. My seller didn't see it was an issue, but because I had been so eager and so specific, uh, they did an assessment of how much that would cost me for being inaccurate on the MLS. And so, yeah. And so uh, this... <laughs> I mean, I was like pretty new. It was my first listing. And so it it bit me. But, um, you know, we hadn't done anything wrong per se, but it was just me putting that out there on the MLS with a date that I had not confirmed. And then I um, also the same thing. They My BIC said, well, just like if they tell you the roof is 2018, unless they have a receipt to show you, don't be, you know, you can put newer roof or, you know, kind of be a little vague. But that, yeah, that cost me a little bit of money. So. Mm, I totally hear you and, and totally valid point because some of those are really easy to read, but some of them aren't and I've yeah. been there, but oh, yeah. thank you for sharing. I well, and, and but the other thing was just, uh, I had a fella who had like a little arsenal going on and some, you know, flags that I had to say, Hey, let's take that down. That's not going to go over well. And let's smoke the weed out back maybe, or, you know, I mean, so it was just a little, you know, um, we, we had some things we had to chat amongst ourselves, but he had a, a, safe a uh, gun safe and it, it it wasn't attached attached it had a thing to hold it so it wouldn't tip over in his closet um and that one screw i mean we got into a little heavy discussion with the new buyers who really wanted they also liked an arsenal etc cetera, etc cetera. very appealing to them and they were arguing back and forth about this gun safe because of that one the anti-tilt thing or whatever that's a fixture and by law that's ours and he has to leave that and my guy's like oh, well, hell no we're not leaving i'm not I'm, I'm, I'm. tell him come over here and get you know i was like oh boy <laughs> so oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so just but uh i mean this really like i said your presentation is a, is a help because just the even though we have somebody that works on listing and she's she's very helpful it just for my piece of, of mine and what I should be doing all throughout the process. So I really appreciate you. 
Oh, well, thank you so much for saying that. I'm so glad you saw value in it. And thank you also for sharing that because it's so, so valuable. And you're totally right. That's actually something I didn't spend a lot of time talking about is, you know, what's a fixture and what's not. And if there's any confusion, just proactively put it in the description and reminding your clients what that means and what seems obvious to us versus what might not be obvious to others. So I've had, I haven't had that exact situation, but I've had other agents that have had situations where the hallway bathroom mirror, um, you know, they didn't want it to convey because it wasn't truly attached, but, you know, at a glance, of course, a buyer would think it is, you know, right. um, or same thing with a front porch swing. It can be a little tricky. So if there's any question marks, just go ahead and adding that. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for adding it. I really appreciate it. Well, I will absolutely send this to you guys. Do you have any other questions or comments or anything that you want to add? Cool. Well, thank you all for your time. I so appreciate you spending the morning with me. I hope to see you at our next one. We're doing another class on Thursday, kind of totally unrelated, but we're talking about working with new construction and the little nuances that come with it. Um, new construction can be a little hard to find our footing in as an agent to provide our value because there's so much waiting and the builder is doing so much. So we'll kind of talk about things that you can add to your scripting that will help set expectations for your client, but also really add some value. Um, but in the meantime, I hope you guys have an amazing day. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. I'm going to drop my information in the chat real quick, and I'm going to hang out on here for just a second. While you guys head out, um, if you want to talk about anything else, feel free to hang around or send me an email or a text. I'm happy to be resource to you guys. Appreciate your time and have a wonderful day. Thanks, Thank you, Kate. Of course. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Terry, for sharing. Of course. Thanks for you. Bye. Hey, girl. Hey, give me one second. Let me try to figure out how to stop. Oh, here we go. Stop recording.